are all doing wonderfully well today. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us. We are excited to share some amazing content with you. Stay tuned and enjoy the experience. We are starting our regular Tuesday webinar where we present to you an exciting and innovative new investment project from Solar Group, Next Generation Airships. Today we will tell you how we are bringing back to life airships in Russia and around the world in this video and provide you with details on how we are doing it, about the company we plan to build in this industry in detail, and of course how you can get involved and earn alongside such a company, including the various aspects of the business, and the potential benefits you can gain by being a part of it. As you understand, airships are indeed a very large and promising field. Today we will talk about this as well. And of course, in order to launch such a project, significant resources are needed, including financial ones. That is why this project is financed through collective investments, allowing you to be a part of it and become co-owners of the business being created in order to... Let's go in order. My name is Pavel Filipov. With me today in the studio is Fedor Konstantinov. And where do we start? We will start with some small results before we move on to talk directly about what we are doing together. What results have already been achieved in terms of numbers? I would like to say that we have confidently surpassed the mark of one and a half thousand investors private individuals who have joined our project from various countries and supported our project with real money. And now we have reached such an important psychological milestone of $500,000 in investments that have come into our project and nearly $5 million in commitments that people have taken on. These are the commitments that they will pay as investments over one, two or three years. We also have this opportunity so the project is successfully gaining momentum. Our project is just over a month old. We are currently at the very beginning, but as you can indeed see, there are already certain results. Well, before we move on to the presentation itself, let us explain what we do and why we are focusing specifically on airships. I would like to ask you to like this broadcast, share this broadcast, and definitely, definitely invite those people who you think might be interested in it. Because, as you already understand, our project is related to crowdfunding. The more people learn about us, and the more interest we generate, the faster our project develops and moves forward. At the end, we will definitely answer your questions. You can start writing to us right now on Vcontacte or YouTube, depending on where you are watching us. We review all questions and respond to all your activity. As you may know, Solar Group is us, the people who have been promoting various projects, innovations, startups, and initiatives for numerous years now. We took a long time to carefully choose which project we were ready to thoroughly undertake because we want this project to be truly promising, backed by a reliable team, and most importantly, to indeed provide opportunities for private investors to earn, as they are often not willing to invest large sums. Accordingly, it should also be significantly scalable. And it seemed that many ideas could have indeed been chosen, but we focus specifically on the theme of reviving airships. And here I want to direct my question to Fedor Konstantinov, who was in particular responsible for selecting the various projects and communicating with the different developers. Fedor, can you tell us why we chose this particular topic and in general what airships are and what their prospects are, in your opinion? Hello, everyone. Yes, Pasha, I will actually start with why we chose this. Initially, Solar Group, like any other crowdfunding company, aims to carefully select a project that is in its early stages of development and is capable of and ready for experiencing explosive growth. This process involves thorough research and analysis to ensure the project's potential for success. This is fundamental because crowdfunding is collective investment 
and for an investor to feel a profit, the growth must be exponential. In addition to being environmentally friendly and technologically advanced, the project should not be some kind of perpetual motion machine. But something real, it must also have a potential for explosive growth. Industry forming, Sergei Semyonov called the property of projects, and such projects were sought after, and so airships are very suitable specifically for this indicator in particular. Let me explain why and moreover provide details. In the world, there are various leaps in technological development, and this technological advancement subsequently influences the structure of the economy. Rails were developed, trains appeared, the economy was restructured, realizing that rails are good, the rails multiplied and the economy became somewhat saturated. Then they invented airplanes, helicopters, and now the economy has indeed become so saturated again that a new logistical solution is needed. Logistics are the veins of the economy. Everyone knows the Silk Road, everything. Along it was expensive and luxurious, while in places where it did not exist, life did not develop as vividly. And it is precisely airships that represent the technology through which the next leap can be made, specifically an economic one. And many countries are aware of this. Analytical agencies are informed. Everyone has already calculated. Reports have been placed on the table. And it has been stated that airships, with their technical and economic indicators in serial and mass production, are capable of achieving an economic miracle. And the miracle on our part was that, in fact, absolutely anyone can say about the airship, I will build airships. That's how Sergei Brie, for example, did. The wonder is that the engineering team has been preserved, including designers, engineers, technologists, and even pilots who have already built airships in modern Russia. They made small devices, including single-seat, two-seat, five-seat, and twelve-seat models, equipped with various equipment. And this team, well, they are not currently making airships, so to speak. Everyone is busy with their own affairs at their jobs, but they have dedicated their entire lives to ballooning. And when we met them, we realized that they needed funding. And we, as Solar Group, needed a really cool project. That's how the stars aligned, and that's why airships. These have become possible precisely because there are designers, there are developments, there is technology, everything is available, and there are industry institutes capable of manufacturing specific nomenclatures from components and assemblies, all of which are then assembled into an airship. And you, Pasha, also asked what exactly an airship is. Indeed, an airship is... What are the specific features in general of how this works? Yes, how does it work? You see, it's very simple. Basically, it works like a helium balloon, essentially. For instance, you can inflate and expand a very large helium-filled balloon, which will easily lift up a mobile phone. Well, it's clear that it will fly high and far, but conditionally we inflated it and he lifted it. How else can it be lifted? By a drone. So. What can stay in the air longer, a balloon or a drone? The drone is more technological, but it will run out of charge because it needs to constantly generate lift with its propellers. The helium balloon is inflated once, and that's it. The lift is essentially perpetual. Of course, there are leaks and so on, and it needs to be stabilized in the air, which requires energy. However, modern technologies allow electric motors to be powered by solar panels. The airship can hover in the air, controlling its position in space with electric motors at a virtually free cost. If we put it very roughly, the lift of the airship does not go anywhere. It is contained in the volume of the upper balloon, filled with helium, and this is what sets it apart from everything else that currently flies in the air. An airplane cannot hover over a city for a couple of days, a helicopter cannot either. They consume fuel for that. A dirigible can hover over a city. There are definitely many significant advantages over modern helicopters and airplanes. 
where airships have their pros and cons compared to airplanes, such as speed and in relation to helicopters, size and disadvantages. But there are many advantages. Everyone knows about them and that's why people all over the world have really started building everything, including us. Can you please tell me in more detail what various types of airships there are, their different lifting capacities, and what tasks they can perform? Is it applied? Yes, I can. The smallest airships they are building are, of course, advertising ones that fly indoors, inside stadiums, inside hangars, and at exhibitions. These are small devices, one meter, two meters, three meters in length. They are toys, but they are still airships because the Archimedes principle lifts them off the ground. They carry a small power unit in the form of a lithium battery. Electric motors, controllers. An airship is a controlled vehicle, translated from French as dirigible. This is the smallest. It is a simple toy, which does not interest us. There are various student projects, including 8-meter and 10-meter airships that can carry a payload of 10 kilograms and fly in an unmanned version. Such a project has already been implemented in Africa. There, the French are helping Africans by creating several such devices to deliver medical supplies between cities. Well, because 10 kilograms there at a speed of 80 kilometers per hour in the absence of roads under calm wind conditions. But he is handling his task, and this is already a commercial project that has been implemented and is operational. The next dimension of airships involves hundreds of kilograms, making it commercially interesting to develop a 500 kilogram unmanned version for distances of 500, 1000 kilometers. This represents the next level of airship after the smaller 10, 20 kilogram models. It is a serious apparatus with its own commercial application sector, but for now it is still somewhat of a toy. The larger the airship, the greater its volume which improves its economic performance and allows it to carry more fuel and energy, as well as more powerful engines. Its lifting capacity increases cubically, while air resistance increases quadratically, making it more controllable and stable. The next step after a 500 kilogram drone is a 10 ton payload capacity, which is no longer a toy, but a serious apparatus. In this 10 tons, you can accommodate a tourist gondola for flying with people to enjoy the view, as well as a passenger gondola. The difference between a tourist and a passenger gondola is that the passenger gondola is simply for transportation from point A to point B, while the tourist gondola offers a more comfortable experience with cabins and a restaurant, all of which can be realized on a 10-ton airship. If you remove this gondola, and make this device uncrewed, it becomes a drone that can transport approximately 15, 20 tons over fairly long distances. And it is also a very good and efficient working machine. Currently, the most widely known and well-known produced aircraft that transports anything is the Soviet Russian helicopter Mi-8 and its modifications. It can carry four tons over several hundred kilometers and the business has adapted to it. As I mentioned at the beginning, when a new tool appears, the economy starts to use that tool. The MI-8 was so successful that around 15,000 units were produced. Throughout its production, the economy has adapted to it, the market has adjusted to it, as well as logistics and manufacturers. And when something needs to be delivered from point A to point B, taken into account, meaning the market is formed around it. And here is that 10-ton machine, which is already serious. It can perform the same task as the MI-8, but carry twice as much. To carry twice as far without vibrations, in comfort at slightly lower speeds, but this is not so frightening for the economy, because the economic effect is actually twice as cheap. In reality, it saves even more on fuel. The cost per ton kilometer is much lower than that of a helicopter. But again, a 10-ton vehicle is still a small apparatus, a 50-ton one is already more interesting. Agricultural tasks come into play here. 
as it can transport combines from field to field, tractors as well, because transporting such large items from one field to another is quite an interesting challenge that is currently being managed, of course. But if you have mm, a 50-ton vehicle capable of carrying something like that through the air, it's fast, firstly, from point A to point B without roads, transshipments, and so on. Secondly, he can not only bring this combine harvester, but he can also bring along these special solutions for the fields. Monitoring systems can be implemented alongside it, and AI is currently being actively integrated. To understand what is happening in your field, essentially you observe that there is under-irrigation here, over-irrigation there, and a lack of nutrients in some areas. Artificial intelligence assesses the situation. In agriculture, for example, they save on the same fertilizer. They start by spraying it with drones only over specific areas. And now the 50-ton airship is facing more ambitious challenges than just travel and cargo transportation. They are already becoming specialized. Just like in agriculture, there are many such areas in various fields. But again, this is a small device. Starting from 100 tons, airships already have a significant competitive advantage in logistics tasks because 100 tons is substantial. And as their efficiency increases with size, the economics become more attractive. But 100 tons is also a small amount, and 200 tons can be done, as well as 400 and 500. The same airships known as Zeppelins were already considered stationary 100 years ago. That was a century ago. And now, with modern materials and technologies, we can do even more. The dimensions of the airship are quite reasonable and engineering friendly. Technologically, it has now become available when the cost of transporting one ton by airship for one kilometer will be the most advantageous of all current logistics solutions being offered. Currently, the most cost-effective option is maritime transport. But it has the lowest cost of transporting one ton per one kilometer. The size of the airship is over 200 tons, and its carrying capacity already provides similar economic indicators. But it is important to note that airships are not competitors to the current logistics system. They do not compete with trucks, ships, or airplanes. Everything is already established, and everything is functioning. No, the system will be supplemented because there are tasks that cannot be solved with the current tools, but with these it will be possible, and the economy will, in a way, expand. These are also stratospheric airships. Again, what types are there? How high do they fly? In general, airships are most advantageous to use close to the Earth. There is high pressure here, which gives helium good lift in this volume. If a dirigible can lift about 10 tons at sea level, the same volume of helium in the stratosphere will, God willing, hold only one ton, because the atmosphere is already thinner there, and it has less lifting power. Size does not matter for the stratosphere, what is important is that a payload can be located at a specific point, move controllably, and descend back. It's like a low orbit grouping. For communication, ground monitoring, observing nature, spying on neighbors, for the internet, for using its distribution, such as these low, well, stratospheric devices. Stratospheric platforms can replace satellites for any country that has just begun its active technological development. They definitely order satellites to be launched into space on rockets, but it would be enough to hang a couple of these stratospheric airships over their territory and manage them easily. In the case of replacement, repair, or maintenance, you can bring them back down, change the load, and it is useful to return them to the stratosphere which cannot be done with a satellite, and it is much cheaper. That is, airships range from toys in concert halls to stratospheric platforms, covering the entire sky and fulfilling all tasks, and more. Here, Fyodor, look, you say that airships can indeed transport passengers and different kinds of cargo. 
And you rightly said that, in principle, the market for airplanes, helicopters and trucks has been established for a long time. What is the advantage of airships? Why do you think they should somehow fit into this when there are already other flying vehicles, as well as trucks, for example, for transporting cargo? Because that's simply how everything is indeed coming together. Perhaps, if we categorize what is their advantage, why are airships really more optimal in certain tasks, in particular, for example? Specifically, in fact, why are they better? A very common solution that many people undoubtedly have in their minds, that airships can undoubtedly and effectively transport oversized items, the same wind turbines, lines, these poles, and power line supports, directly take it from the manufacturer's production factory, drag it to the necessary point, and place it right where it needs to stand. For example, no one can accomplish such a task at all. Nothing except for the airship is capable of doing it like that. On one hand, on the other hand, no, let me just say something about large dimensions now, now. There are many various and complex tasks. For example, at Rosatom they manufacture their large-scale and intricate reactors, and the reactor needs to be delivered somehow. Rosatom has already laid the groundwork for the construction of nuclear power plants in many countries. Somewhere in the heart of our country, in Chelyabinsk, these reactors are conditionally manufactured, and delivering it from point A to point B is a whole special operation. First of all, they are immediately manufactured, taking into account the available tools. First it's a train, then it's sea transport, and then again it's a train for the journey. Trains have maximum allowable dimensions, so we will be using a certain size, but for airships, unnecessary. They create it in sections and transport it there in sections. All these transshipments are first from the train to the sea transport, and from the sea to the train. Then they will have to assemble and weld the entire structure there, meaning sending teams over a bit more. With the airship, it was possible to take the entire reactor from the manufacturer, assembled, and place it in a prepared location somewhere in Africa, right where it would stand and operate further, delivering it from point A to point B. Well, right now nothing can be done. An airplane needs an airport, meaning you first transport something from the factory by truck to the airplane, load it onto the airplane, then fly from one airport to another, and again unload from the airplane to a truck, and off you go. The airship picks up from the manufacturer and delivers directly to the consumer. This task no one can solve. That's what makes them better. They can transport cargo from point A to point B. It will be much faster. You can Google the average speed of freight trains in our country and in European countries. They move faster here. Regarding the average speed of a truck compared to the average speed of maritime transport, when you realize that the average speed of a train in this case is only 8 kilometers per hour, it turns out that a truck travels at about 10 to 20 kilometers per hour though 20 is even too much, it will probably be around 12, it is clear that an airship taking goods from point A to point B, even at a speed of 100 kilometers per hour, accomplishes this task much faster. In some instances, this, even with the same airplane, get it to the plane, load it up, it will fly very quickly from airfield to airfield. But if you overload it again, put it on a truck, the average speed will still end up being lower than that of the airship. That is, it can perform logistical tasks faster. It is clear that when it comes to intercontinental flights, the airplane is still the choice. However, even to deliver something to the airplane itself will ultimately be easier by airship. What else makes them better? Well, they are safer, much safer than airplanes and helicopters. Nothing can happen to the airship. If an airplane has a system failure, it can at least glide if it has enough speed. If a helicopter has a failure, it falls like a stone, immediately. 
Even if everything fails, the airship will still remain in the air and descend very slowly, completely without incident. Neither with the cargo, whatever happens, nor with the passengers, it feels more like how it would be on a sinking ship. Well, I hope it won't happen, but to draw an analogy, if something happens to the airplane, it's all a crash. Goodbye. If something happens to the airship, it's like with a boat, a large motorboat, a yacht, sectioned, the engines fail, the onboard systems fail, and even the shell is punctured. Something will happen with the airship. It's like with a boat, a large motorboat, for example, a yacht, which is multi-hulled. If somewhere the engines fail, it's clear, that's it. The ballast systems don't work, and they even punctured the hull conditionally. It is just as multi-sectioned as on yachts. If one section of the yacht is breached, it is isolated and the yacht does not start to sink. The second one doesn't sink either, the third one doesn't sink either, the fourth one, well, something conditionally started there, but most likely it will also hold. And only then, with critical damage, will it start to noticeably sink. The same goes for the airship. It won't sink anywhere if you're hitting it, and if it has already been badly damaged, it will just start to descend slowly. But this will be safe. From a safety perspective, airships are recognized as the safest form of air transport. At least here in Russia, the Scientific and Technical Council recently made such a decision, after which both the government of our country and the Ministry of Defense issued assignments. The government has issued an assignment for the current quarter of 2024 in order to provide a proposal for the development and implementation of the airship industry with capacities ranging from 20 to 200 tons. There are indeed problems that cannot be solved today, and everyone has understood this a long time ago. And here is another very interesting video where we also posted on social media that indeed, even when comparing some classic tasks, the airship is often more economically viable. Transporting some cargo. I really like the thesis that all flying vehicles struggle against gravity, trying to overcome the laws of physics. In contrast, the airship flies using the laws of physics, making it much more efficient in this regard. One of the applications, and how it is better, is that an airship, for example, can serve as a large flying laboratory for some scientific purpose, a big medical center or anything else, even a boiler room with fuel and equipment. It can solve a local problem in a remote area, such as providing medical services to the population, and a large airship can calmly arrive effectively bringing a clinic to you. Such a thing does not exist. And this can be done now. Trains are starting to do this, medical buses, and an airship could actually arrive as a clinic. It might be possible to do this on a large airplane, like those that were designed during the Soviet era, but the problem is that we don't produce them now, and it would probably cost hundreds of times more to manufacture such an airplane than a dirigible. I liked the idea, by the way, of Vadim Zubkevich, who spoke at the last webinar. A civil registry office on an airship, so that the union of a man and a woman is sealed in the heavens. This is also one of those very interesting ideas about how it can be used. At the same time, this may seem like fantasy to some, in terms of the registry office and other things. Yes, indeed, these are not the top priority tasks. There are more practical tasks, so to speak, such as rescue operations in hard to reach places. I understand that many airship projects around the world are currently focused on this, particularly regarding what you mentioned, Bryn, the co-founder of Google, who is now creating his own state-owned company in America. At least he declares that it is specifically for various rescue operations. What other companies are currently developing this direction? I mean, we have mentioned several times that it feels like a real airship race has begun. It seems that the time has come, the technology allows it, 
And now everyone is starting to try to build their own airships around the same time, with some even achieving certain successes. The Chinese have certainly indeed had successes. They we traveled, I don't remember how much, either in kilometers or in hours, some thousands, well, probably kilometers. They already have their first certified airship, which has passed all tests and, roughly speaking, completed its first operational period. Following this, they have now ordered the serial production of 10 more such devices. This is practically a copy of our Russian AU-30 and they plan to use it for tourism purposes, just like in Friedrichshafen, Germany. The New Zeppelin is flying. There are two of them operating there. They are gathering a third one, but they have been collecting it for a long time, and it will take a while before they complete it. But here is an example of two live companies in tourism. One has been in tourism in Germany for a long time. In China, one device is operational, it is flying, certified, and producing ten more devices has already begun. They wouldn't say so, but they are modern because they are in line with our times today. However, there are practically no breakthrough technologies. It's just a copy of what we did in our country a long time ago, and the same goes for Germany. Sergei Brin wanted to create something newer, but again, he repeated everything old. There is nothing new there. However, he has an airship and it is already flying. The English-Irish have attempted to implement some innovations. Primarily, they wanted to change the appearance of the airship itself, meaning they aimed to make it not the classic cigar shape. They combined several cigars, two of them, with a small one in the middle. I don't know what guided them, but their initial tests, they apparently don't get along with gas dynamics, and in general, with the dynamics of controlling the device. There are many videos on the internet showing how this airlander flew. It would nosedive into the ground, but nothing happened to it. It just bounced back up like a ball. It didn't crash or get damaged. Nothing terrible happened to it. But managing a device of non-classical shape is indeed quite challenging. Firstly, because there was at least some experience in managing devices of a somewhat classical shape and also in the field. There are theories, there are calculations. It is not a classical form. It is a highly experiential story, experimental even in experience. Well, it seems they have learned to stabilize it more or less. And now there is also information circulating on the internet that they will start producing about a dozen of them for cruise purposes. But this will be a VIP cruise where a ticket costs $200,000 and a small number of passengers will fly in luxury class to the North Pole and back. This is from the large aircraft of the French. They stated that by 1925-1926, they would assemble a device also for tourism with a small number of seats, but which would operate entirely on solar energy. Half of the upper part of its body will be covered with solar panels. It is environmentally friendly and designed for tourism. There is already a sense of modernity here with solar panels, electric motors, and an energy storage system. The question they will solve, it is unlikely to carry lithium. Perhaps they will use electrolyzers powered by hydrogen, but we will see. So far, there hasn't been anything visible in terms of hardware. They are most likely hiding it from prying eyes. Since they say they will launch it into the air in the next couple of years, they must have already started something. Many people make small devices. There are also smaller ones weighing about 10, 40 kilos. They launched it both in Africa and in a European uh, country simultaneously at the same time. In addition, in a European country, I don't remember which, maybe in France, they made a small device, a toroidal one. It is intended to be used for monitoring power lines and other related infrastructure. Like a drone, it simply flies, monitors the condition of power lines and creates a 3D image of them. This was also built. The air was raised literally last year. It seems that no one is really aware, but in fact, at least two companies in the world are currently planning to create a stratospheric hotel, like a kind of hotel which is quite an ambitious and innovative project. 
The fact that the capsule rises directly using Archimedes' principle means it is also controllable, which makes it an airship, but more accurately it is a balloon. They rise into the stratosphere, people relax, looking at the planet from above, and then, in some wonderful way, this whole story lands. There are a couple of such startups as well, they have announced this, but so far there has been nothing visible in terms of hardware. Yes, and most importantly, you forgot to mention everyone, but you didn't talk about our guys, because as far as I know, there are also people in Russia who are building small airships. You were talking about the team from Bauman, for example, who already have successful launches. And this is already our project. We have united everyone who was in our country. In our country, there are many enthusiasts, many professionals, and many people from the aviation industry who all recognize that airships have a future, and they continue to engage with them in their spare time. We made small models, conducted calculations, and gathered on Saturday evenings to discuss the direction in which the industry would move. We are currently developing our project based on this Shadow Design Bureau and there are also small stratospheric devices and we plan to launch two additional important and significant devices before the new year and one such device this month. It is a brief short duration flight where the Technology of analog digital radio communication with HD image transmission will be tested. HD quality, live streaming, directly on the internet, micro-neocar, but already moving towards the development of large stratospheric platforms. They also have these guys, well, that small drone, the airship, actually. The current task is to make it unmanned, as it has only flown in remote control mode to write the necessary algorithms for it to operate in drone mode, we also need to conduct this NEOCA, and we have already conditionally started it. By March, there is a promise of a larger airship, more serious than this small 10 kilogram one, which can carry something. I honestly don't remember how much, maybe up to 100. It is also in the development stage. Well, it was created out of enthusiasm, but it is not finished, and we are taking all of this. It is clear that we are all finishing this up, and these are all very small, quick steps that will happen literally within six months. And during these same six months, serious devices will also be developed. Therefore, yes, Pasha, we are also fully in this race. And it turns out that when talking about the most important aspect, about the brains, about the team, this project has been in preparation for more than one year. The task, as I understand it, was indeed to bring these people together and to unite the teams who have already built airships in Russia, who understand this in practice. And at this moment, yes, the project has started precisely now also because we managed to do this, right? Yes, we managed to gather a team. You are indeed right about everything. We have been working on this for three years already. We met with the airship pilots. They introduced us to their friends, with whom they are involved in all of this, and the rest. We communicated. It feels a bit strange because we seem to have already launched the project, yet new people keep coming forward saying, I used to work with these airships. Look at what I have. And it feels like everyone in our country has been involved in it. Well, the people who are connected to aviation and the team is taking shape. Currently, the core group is already abundantly clear and indeed even more so now that it has been formed. But this moment, it is being structured into a certain architecture because before it was more like Come on guys, let's meet in the evenings and think about what kind of airships we will build. And now, when all of this has come to action, we still need to assign roles and distribute tasks. It is clear that one person had one set of projects in mind. 
another had different ones, and a third had yet another. But ultimately, in the optimal scenario, they all converge. And now those very optimal options have already crystallized. And now the architecture of the collective is crystallizing. So yes, everything is in place, and the work has begun. So let's move on to what is planned to be done. At this particular moment in time, we have everything we need in order to successfully get started. We have a highly skilled and experienced team. We have people who built airships and are ready to do it once again. We have a large community of people who are ready to support this project both financially and with other forms of assistance if there is anything to offer. Many people there, including, would like to get a job at the new company being created. And let's take a look a little into the future, a bit more in the near future. I will now explain how I understand it, in my opinion, and then you can specify and elaborate on each point, detailing what we do and how exactly we do it, step by step, and in detail. Look, friends, a company is being created that will be engaged in the construction, production, and operation of such flying vehicles, airships. These airships will be highly modern and extremely innovative. They should not be compared to what humanity built in the past. And within this framework, this is a Russian company, and within this company, various assets and different directions will be created where work will be conducted. In this context specifically, what exactly will be done First, of course, a design bureau will be established. Essentially, this is the place where engineers and the team responsible for managing the company will be located, focusing on the design of aircraft, their testing, and everything necessary for these aircraft to exist and be produced in the required quantities. It will be necessary to acquire, obtain, or secure land in partnership in collaboration with other entities on which the facilities for producing these airships will be located. Fedor will now provide more details about this in the near future. On this land, in this area, there will be hangars. It is initially planned to build two large hangars in the initial phase where the aircraft will be manufactured. One has a capacity of two tons and the other has a capacity of 10, 15 tons, different purposes and different tasks. And we have chosen the commercially viable options that can generate income today, which are in demand and where the purpose of these flying machines is clear. We will need to set up and establish a new production facility where various critical technologies and equipment will also be developed there in order to manufacture them because the aircraft themselves are a complex and intricate product. Therefore, various contractors will be involved including institutes and different manufacturing plants. I eat, I eat. In order not to outsource everything, to maintain the uniqueness of the product, to ensure that critical technologies are not stolen, and for us to have competitive advantages, including over those companies that are also building airships, we will produce some things ourselves without outsourcing them. A common question, of course, is who will manage these airships and who will also service them. Of course, I recently flew on an airship in Germany and the process is the same as flying on an airplane. Everything is there. Everything is there. There is a flight attendant, a pilot and other staff who help the airship take off and so on. And of course, all of them need to be trained. Such a school will be established. Although there are certainly such pilots, they are quite few. In any case, they will need to learn how to fly the new modern aircraft that will be created. A school for this purpose will be established. There are already certain agreements in place and people who will be involved in this. By creating these facilities, including a design bureau as a kind of brain that can design and create various aircraft, it is expected that these capabilities will be sufficient not only to serve our own interests, particularly in producing airships, selling them and operating them, 
but also to collaborate with third party companies that may need their own aircraft for specific uh, tasks and goals. In particular, for example, Fyodor mentioned today that their own airships will be necessary and they are needed by Roscosmos for transporting the same rockets that will then fly into space. They may also be suitable for the aircraft that we will indeed produce, but there is a catch. The market for airships and ideas for their application is so vast that such companies may require airships, so to speak, for special purposes, and we will be able to design various types of aircraft for them, set up production, and create a unique product for them. Let's go into more detail. Fedor, could you please tell us about each and every individual element uh, and what it will specifically represent? I will now briefly demonstrate schematically what I just talked about and clearly. And let me clarify once again that we are indeed talking about a horizon of three to five years. What I have just described is only the first step. This is what will be created within the framework of the current investment project. But we already know where we will go next, how we will continue to develop, and now Fedor will also tell us more about it. It all starts with the Design Bureau. The Design Bureau consists of people organized into a specific architecture within an organizational structure located in one place. These are rental spaces in an office equipped with the necessary tools such as computers, software, salaries, and of course motivation united by a common goal. Doing its job, and this stage is already being organized. We thank God have finally rented an office currently. I sent a video in Telegram 500 square meters near Sokol metro station this will be the heart of this project. All the designers, engineers, technologists, and project management will be there. The Design Bureau will be the lead developer in charge of the overall project development and implementation, similar to the Soviet program. It will create a preliminary project, a sketch project, and will send tasks for further development and production to industry-specific entities based on technical specifications. An institute, a production facility that specializes specifically in engines, envelopes, propellers, fuel systems, transmissions, the gondola cabin, and design in general. Everything will be produced and developed in broad cooperation in various fields and sectors, including technology, healthcare, and education. There is no point in counting screws in your design bureau. If there is a company that successfully does this, and there is also no point in creating your own engine from scratch, if there is a company that specializes in aviation engines, let it handle that. And this is the lead developer in the team who accumulates all the knowledge and all the developments and experience that they oversee. In the future, all of this is currently being gathered together. This design bureau is already being formed. Two types of devices will be developed. In it, one lifts two tons and the other lifts 10 tons. Why are two specified here? Well, it's for demonstration purposes. One flight test for the certification of these devices will not be sufficient. We need two, ideally almost five, to produce, but I think we can manage with two in order to obtain the type certificate for their further serial production. These two-ton pieces of equipment can either be a six-seat passenger model, which can carry approximately one ton of passengers and additional freight, or if it has a lighter gondola, it can carry up to two tons in a drone version. This drone can transport these two tons over a distance of 1,000. 
to 1,500 kilometers, or lift a certain load and hover over a specific point for several days. This is indeed the smallest size of this device that makes sense to start with. All airship enthusiasts are afflicted with this giantomania and want to build a huge one right away. But it's better to proceed gradually, starting with a smaller craft. And so we have conditionally created this project, we have defined it, and the next one is a 10-tonner. And so this design bureau will immediately start developing two very serious devices like these one weighing approximately two tons and the other around ten tons, not counting the smaller developers that we will definitely be working with. These are small stratospheric devices, small airships indeed. While the devices are currently being designed, we need to carefully decide on the suitable land where we will appropriately place the hangars. Conditionally, there will be a bump two schematic options now, because ideally the first step is to build a small podelling. This is the assembly shop where it will be assembled. The shell came from this institute, engines came from this factory, the gondolas, propellers, avionics, tail assembly and more came from here. This is the assembly shop where it is being put together. The shell came from this institute, the engines came from that factory, the gondolas came from there, the propellers from over there, the avionics, the host tail assembly, and so on. All of this is assembled inside the hangar, where the final assembly and helium inflation of the airship take place. There are all the various systems, different devices and machines and equipment for its testing. The airship is currently ready for takeoff and in general it usually gathers in this hangar before going off to attend to its business. Like any car, airplane, helicopter and any machinery, there is technical maintenance. A hangar is a facility for assembling and maintaining the devices that are built within it. They need to be constructed somewhere. Current facilities that are suitable in size can be used. There are either old hangars or large ones or large old hangars. And huge, huge old Soviet workshops from heavy construction castings where the dimensions can reach 40 meters in width, 40 meters in height, and 200 meters in length. And we have such workshops available, generally speaking, they can be used, but for large-scale manufacturing it is better to build from scratch what is ideally suited for the assembly of devices and their maintenance, rather than taking what is available and doing it imperfectly. The economics are considered in both cases. So far no final decision has been made about whether we will build from scratch or perhaps we will assemble the first units in the existing facilities. However, a hangar is needed in any case. We will not be able to provide a full range of services for clients without our own hangars, because the same large client says, I need a big airship with a hangar, build it. And we are like, yes, we haven't built that yet. We have just taken what is available. This is not a conversation, of course. In this area, one also needs to have their own competency. There are currently two options available at the moment. The first option is to acquire the land as property, meaning to purchase it with funds from the project. This is the ideal option, as it is your own land. Here, there are also two options, to take prepared land or unprepared land. Unprepared land is simply agricultural land vast areas available for reasonable prices. These are old Soviet airfields, and there are many of them. They are suitable. The land is already leveled there. Some are used, some are not, but that involves completely different money. But here you acquired it, and right away you have all of the necessary permits ready immediately. This is already an official aerograd that can be flown over, it is clear that there are some that cannot be flown over, so it is better to choose those that can. But to take agricultural land and start preparing all the necessary permits and approvals, coordinating everything meticulously with the various administrations, conducting extensive work to level the land, compact it thoroughly and so on, will undoubtedly take much longer. Here, 
a couple of years at the very least, will be needed just to change the land designation from one specific purpose to another, to eventually turn it into an aerograd. This is very difficult, and we are considering this option as a last priority. In the penultimate one, we are considering buying some kind of aerograd. Everything related to purchasing fits perfectly in every possible detail and aspect with the project. The project gains some capitalization. It starts to own land, and the buildings and structures fully belong to it. The funds are preserved and will not go anywhere. The second scenario that could potentially occur is the rental of land, possibly even a small plot in an active aerotropolis, or even renting a plot for the construction of a hangar. It is much cheaper here than to acquire your own and build something. However, there are risks that if someone really likes the project and the hangar is on someone else's land, then there is indeed a risk involved. But this becomes more interesting in terms of timelines and money. This is a more quickly implementable concept, and such proposals already exist regarding the leasing of land in certain locations air cities. But there is also a third story that we are very much hopeful about, indeed about it. And there are such requests as well. I have an aerograd, guys. Let's somehow enter into a partnership, into co-founding. For example, you invest a little in my company and I invest just a tiny bit in yours. And there you go. My land is already your land. Build whatever you want. I also want to develop airships. And this is indeed the very coolest scenario that we are currently moving forward with cautiously. And here's what I want to say. There are a lot of proposals. Everyone is calling with their airfields and aerocytes. We have a dedicated person who handles this. He has been doing it his whole life. Resold air cities and airfields helped to build infrastructure there and put them into operation. As it turned out, he is an acquaintance, quite close, and he said that he would help now. We will find the perfect solution, no problem. He is working in this direction. As soon as we finalize our decision, we will let you know in what form this land will be acquired, whether it will be purchased, leased, or if we will enter into a partnership, but it will become ours. The issue regarding the land is being addressed specifically to build the hangars I mentioned earlier. There are standard hangars that can be ordered from organizations that have already designed, built, and operated them. However, our hangar will be non-standard. Organizations that have already designed, built, operated, and so on. But our hangar will be non-standard, as it will incorporate new, innovative, and absolutely incredible solutions that have never been used on airships before. We believe that they are cutting edge and advanced. For example, the fact that an airship in the city center can land on the roof of a building, similar to how helicopter pads are made on some residential complexes. It would be a similar platform, but with specific mechanisms. A hangar for the airship can and should indeed be created. In fact, it is definitely and absolutely necessary. It will be built in such a way as to test this technology Specifically, landing on the roof, loading and unloading passengers, and maneuvering on that same roof. The hangar will be non-standard, and only one non-standard hangar is needed. We think it will either be a small hangar number one, designed for two-ton vehicles, meaning it will be small, or we might skip hangar number one altogether and go straight to hangar number two, which will be large but also have a functional roof. There will be both 10-ton vehicles and two-ton vehicles that will fit in comfortably. This is not yet a final management decision. But it is definitely preferable to set up your own hangar because new technologies can be tested there and more. This involves ground-based operation, including but not limited to careful and precise landing, mooring, and maneuvering of the hangar at special sites, involving various complex procedures. The airships anchored to the mooring mast and turned around the mast with the wind. Now it is possible to create a platform where the airship will land, directly attaching with the gondola and maneuvering around, meaning that the gondolas can also be adjusted according to the wind. No one has done this before. 
this is how it should be done and how we will do it. There are in general many technical solutions which I will discuss a little later. I will tell you, many have seen videos, old archival ones, showing how airships were pulled out of the hangar with hundreds of people pulling on ropes and then they would gently release it and it would start to ascend. This is a technical medieval issue. We won't have that but it is also a problem that needs to be solved from an engineering perspective. This is a kind of platform on which the airship is already sitting, inside the hangar, where it rolls out on rails beyond the hangar. It stands there maneuvering, takes off with the wind, and lands back on it. All these solutions will be developed, produced, tested, certified, and patented in the first hangars, of course. That's about it, indeed. What's next for us, do you think? Perhaps maybe... Semi-production involves a detailed and thorough process. Yes. Regarding production, technological processes will be mastered here. There will be no need to build a huge factory or construct anything. Rental spaces will be suitable here as well. Everything is similar to the design bureau. It will be necessary to simply rent a small space and establish technological processes for certain critical technologies such as the soldering of shells and so on. We won't talk about that for now, but here it is mentioned that there is no need to build a factory. Sufficient rental spaces will do and perhaps even rented equipment. This could be available, for example, in some techno park or economic zone, of which we have plenty in our country now, where there are both spaces and equipment, and you can produce and create something there. In such a scenario, it is enough for us to establish our critical technological processes, which we will not outsource, but simply ensure that they are not copied. If everything is distributed, someone might go through the same instances and say what you did for them. You can do the same for me. To prevent them from achieving that, critical technological processes will be the intellectual property of the project, including both the development itself and the technological processes of critical technologies. About the school, which has a rich history and a vibrant community, Pavel has already mentioned that there are many dedicated people who are willing to take on this significant burden and bring it to fruition with great effort and determination. We have highly certified airship pilots and certified technicians and other essential supporting personnel necessary for their operation. To achieve this, first, in order to train a pilot, it is necessary to train an expert who will then train the pilot. In order to train an expert, it is necessary to create manuals, a training methodology, various simulators and more. And this entire complex is a challenging task for us, but at least we have the resources. In the country, there are people who are involved in this. And when they heard the word airship, they rushed over and said that even if you hit me with a stick, I will build a school for training airship pilots. I just finished building one for light aircraft and hot air balloons with this glider and so on now we can definitely even create a school for airship pilots based on it this will also be part of the project it could even function as a separate business because the operating company, for example, the same airline that currently provides passenger and cargo transportation services, will have an additional tool in the form of an airship that can solve certain tasks. This operating company realizes, great, I now need personnel. And the staff needs to be trained. So this school will, of course, train the staff on a commercial basis. So that's also important. In due time, it will become a commercially profitable direction rather than a subsidized one, which is good, of course. Yes, about the clients. I just mentioned that there can be clients and there will be 
regarding additional airships. The prospect of 3.5 years is too pessimistic. It was stated that these two hangars will be built, the design bureau has been formed, the land has been acquired, the hangars have been constructed, designed, tested on the ground, built, tested in the air, and certified. These four vehicles, two two-ton vehicles and two ten-ton vehicles, in general, a two-ton vehicle can be built within a year, but it will be like a pirate version. It will take off and it will fly, but obtaining all the documents for it and certifying it is a task that will take at least three years. To begin with, even obtaining certification and licensing for the enterprise that does all of this is quite a challenge. What is the procedure? Then of course the production process and followed by the testing steps. In general, a lot of time is needed for this airship to officially be able to carry out any passenger transport in the country. It's just a little further away, maybe exactly five years. Freight transportation will take three years and it will take off in about a year. It may take a little longer, but plus or minus a year to a year and a half is a fairly reasonable time frame for designing the lift of air for even a 10-ton vehicle, provided there is sufficient funding. As soon as these works get underway, and they will get underway by the new year regarding the design, the connection of industry production institutes, and so on. Once the work starts, clients may appear, and they will appear, who will say, that's it, we understand, this company is serious, they are doing real things. Can you make, for example, a 50-ton vehicle for us? We have a certain task, we see it, calculate the economics, we will calculate it there, they will say, it fits perfectly. Here is the placement of the order with you. And we are currently building such a legal architecture. Well, and in general, that is the idea. When the client comes and pays for the development of some large apparatus, naturally, the development, testing, production and mailing need to be accounted for, and somewhere it needs to be built, and so on. Naturally, the company includes profit in all of this whether it is a one-time profit from development or some percentage from operation. In general, profit is accounted for right away. The client's money comes in immediately. Therefore, the company is already making a profit and we can distribute it as dividends. So nothing is stopping us. That's exactly what we were thinking. Therefore, the prospect of three to five years involves the construction of what has already been mentioned which includes certain clients with special projects. And after these three to five years, what will happen? There will be serial production of these devices, as well as two-ton vehicles and ten-ton vehicles in the hangars that will be built. Next, there will be slides with figures regarding profitability. In just one production year of serial airship units, it will already pay off multiple times its cost, and naturally, there will be additional external customers. In five years, within one year of producing serial airships, it will already pay off multiple times its cost. But there is more to come, of course, plus those external clients and those external clients. So, in all our calculations, we are indeed following the most conservative scenario. We talk about profit and, accordingly, about the capitalization of such a business only based on the fact that we have designed the airships, we are producing them in series, uh, and we sell them directly to those who actually need this flying vehicle, not even taking into account what you mentioned about the second revenue stream where we are indeed already working directly on a special flying vehicle for a specific customer. Therefore, the figures we mention are indeed very conservative. And with all that, I have included the next slide. We are talking about the prospects for the coming years and what can be done with the project budget of approximately $100 million. Now, we will discuss the figures in more detail. But, of course, there is indeed an understanding of where the company should be heading. 
and what types of aircraft will be built in the slightly more medium term perspective of exactly five to 10 years. At the same time, these developments are already available to the engineers who will be involved in the design of the first airships. But the initial devices are expected to be the most commercially interesting flying vehicles, as there is already demand for them, clear here and now. However, what you see at the moment, 20 tons, 40 tons, 200 tons, and stratospheric airships are also interesting, flying vehicles that are needed. Nevertheless, as Fedor said, it is important to move forward progressively. It is probably unwise to build a stratospheric airship or a 200-ton airship if you haven't yet created a small one. This relates to further development. There is a clear understanding that additional hangars will definitely be built. Here you can clearly see two more additional hangars where flying vehicles will be assembled. Moreover, I remember Fyodor said that they could be used for the production of 10-ton vehicles. Perhaps two hangars will be for 10-ton vehicles, very common and serve as workhorses. Alternatively, they could be for future flying vehicles. And all of this will either be brought into existence using the profits that will be generated or by utilizing additional funding and resources, which in principle always helps any business move forward in various ways. It should be noted right away that if additional funding is used, both collective investments and possibly already large private investments uh, from a specific investor, these will be external companies, such as subsidiaries, within this large holding. This is essentially about the fact that the current share of investors who are currently investing in the market now will not be diluted. Even if additional funds are attracted at this moment, it is very important to understand that in the case of creating a separate subsidiary company that will, for example, focus solely on stratospheric airships, the founders of this company will indeed be this parent company that we are currently establishing, such as, so by investing today and building this company with us, you will always profit from all the commercial activities and ventures that this company will engage in the future, ensuring a continuous stream of benefits and returns for you as a valued partner. Well, I think it is obvious that this company will grow and develop. The goal of any business is always to increase profits, expand its capacities and open parallel business directions. And naturally, those who get involved today, those who help this company achieve its first commercial successes, will indeed also participate and benefit from all of this. You can also see in this diagram that client 3 and client 4 appear. This indicates that in the next 5 to 10 years, which is a significant period, after this company receives complete and unwavering support through crowdfunding, which is a modern and innovative method, we will have a large and rapidly developing company that will produce at least six airships according to our plan and work with a large number of external customers and clients in order to fulfill their possibly very specific and detailed requests and requirements for particular aircraft and ensure that all of their needs are met. Fyodor, are you there? At the very beginning, as I mentioned earlier, I mentioned that the Solo Group is selecting an initiative that has the potential to explode widely, both financially and technologically. Creating a certain industry, our project is not about building two hangars, producing two devices and manufacturing them in series, not at all. The project is ultimately about creating a new and innovative industry. We will have to lead this emerging and groundbreaking industry. We will be the headliners of this significant event and set the latest trends in this rapidly evolving field. We will have to produce them both in series and in mass, operate them efficiently, perform special tasks, carry out regular household tasks, repair these airships, 
and replace them after several decades. Each device has a lifespan, just like a car. An airship will have an average lifespan of 15 years. And after 15 years, the devices we have set up will need to be replaced with new ones. This is a whole industry. It will last a very long time, for a hundred years. When something emerges, it usually operates for at least that long. And then future generations will manage it. The project is enormous, a project for the ages. I would like it to last at least a century, that's definitely for sure. And there is the parent company that we are creating through crowdfunding. It is the very bud, the very seed that will give rise to this huge industry tree. We believe that such an unsinkable concept is an active design bureau. Land, a couple of wellings, a couple of flying certified devices, a school, production, and an operating company. This is the absolutely necessary minimum requirement that will definitely already break even. It can be scaled further and worked with. And this is the project that has formed for us at approximately $100 million, which is a significant amount in total. Furthermore, this thing can pay out dividends and attract external funding. It scales, it scales, it scales, and it won't go away. So, for example, we could gather to build one airship, but what comes next? We could gather together and... In order to develop the necessary technologies and also form the required team and gain the necessary experience, we created such a program, named it a project, and started it together with you, in collaboration with you, as well as together with you. Yes, and when we talk about uh, what we mentioned regarding this company, even without external clients and having just two hangers and two design devices, it will already actually produce $300, $400 million in financial profit. So you pointed out well that this business pays off quite quickly. In fact, and it is precisely for this reason, which is why at this particular moment in time, it allows for so-called X's, providing opportunities for those investors who are deciding to join today. But why do we even consider that this profit is indeed very extremely small for such an industry? Today, I already mentioned that just a couple of weeks ago, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Germany and flew on a Zeppelin airship, which they are very actively using for tourism purposes, among other things. Each device makes 12 flights a day, so it's quite a workhorse. And even with two active aircraft currently operational today, as Fyodor previously mentioned, with a third one currently being assembled, they earn approximately between 100 to 150 million euros each year. Therefore, for this direction, the figures that are mentioned are not just attainable. They are indeed very cautious and conservative. In fact, they are absolutely achievable. If we turn to the numbers, Fyodor has already mentioned that in order to achieve the basic minimum on which one can earn, and for the company to be able to develop without additional infusions or investments, and to be self-sufficient in paying dividends and so on, it is necessary to attract $100 million in investments for the project. This takes into account all potential expenses, including marketing to attract these investments. And this money is planned to be raised within a period of approximately three to five years. Today, Fyodor also mentioned that the aircraft will appear much sooner, meaning that this is also a time frame with a margin. At the same time, when we talk about the amount of approximately $100 million, we are generally also laying out a cautious conservative scenario because it is no secret to anyone that this is not our first investment project. And at the moment, we are currently capable of attracting $100 million in about three years, even with the current financial indicators. But we are actively continuing to grow. 
we are significantly increasing the amount of attracted investments and the number of people who know more about us. So we will work to make this happen even faster. So we have a plan for three years. This is our internal goal, and it is more than achievable given our current pace, which we have already effectively reached. From the $1 billion in capitalization of this company that we are creating together, based on the classic valuation of a company, we multiply uh, the annual profit by three, and we get $1 billion. And again, I emphasize that this is a conservative scenario because here we intentionally do not take into account the additional money that is expected to be earned through collaboration with external clients, and we do not consider the speculative valuation, which will be decisive here. You know that in reality, well-known companies on the stock market are valued not at three annual profits, but at 1020. And some companies, if I'm not mistaken, like Apple, are valued at around 30 to 40 annual profits. Therefore, the speculative valuation here will actually be much higher. But we are used to speaking in terms of numbers and reasonably considering everything. Well, let's say according to standard business logic, in a way and in general, but even with these relatively modest estimates, it already allows those investors who joined today in fact, to earn 10, 50, or even up to a staggering 100 times on their investments, depending on when you join this project. I will also talk about this now. About capitalization. Just think for yourself. Just imagine this. On Nev's radio, a company has emerged in the world that produces airship drones, tourist aircraft that deliver extremely important cargo, for instance, such as rocket carriers to spaceports. Indeed, this company creates stratospheric devices in a manner similar to orbital constellations. Communication, remote sensing of the Earth, the same devices. This same company designs devices for agriculture. What could its market capitalization be? It is like space. It immediately becomes like SpaceX. And so from that minimum amount we are initially starting with, from those very minimal funds, we want to attract approximately $100 million, which is, roughly speaking, one unit. Uh, so how much can all of this multiply in total? From the volume of tasks being addressed, the dizzying fantasticality, like the flying hotel you have there, or this satellite constellation, or the drone that carries tons over 2,000 kilometers. It is impossible to assess the capitalization from a speculative point of view, as Pasha called it in general. Most likely it's an X there. A thousand or more? So yes, we calculated it. Just according to that, here is one annual profit from serial production, which will be able to support these two hangars that we will build what they will be able to provide will generate profit. And this profit was multiplied from sales, not even from operation, not from the school, not from external projects. Here is the dry sale of serial devices. The net profit multiplies by approximately three, totaling a billion. This is already a billion dollars in capitalization, which is already X10. Considering all the specifics and plans of the company, I think it will be a lot. Yes, we can definitely confidently look at, as I mentioned, examples from other technology companies. It is easy to find a huge number of companies that are valued at 20, 30 times their annual profits. Well, accordingly, we can multiply 300 by 10, 20 or 30. And this is all more than true. There are enough such companies. But yes, we consider it a conservative scenario. I liked how you said last time that when the first airship takes off into the sky, the capitalization will soar into the sky. And when the first airship flies into space, into the stratosphere, the capitalization will soar there as well, into the stratosphere. 
Now let's discuss in more detail about what the investors receive directly. We talked about what kind of company is being created, why it needs money, how it will earn, and what is being offered to the investor in return for the money that he is ready to invest in the project. A Russian company is being established. In fact, it already exists. Currently, all the necessary legal framework is being prepared and everything is as transparent as possible. This company can be found in any registry of legal entities in Russia and all documents can be reviewed. Overall, in Russia, everything regarding this is quite clear and transparent. Investors are offered approximately half of the company for a total financial investment of $100 million, specifically 49%, while 51% remains with the team that will directly implement the project, oversee the management of the company, and commercialize these airships. This team will also provide financial oversight and ensure the successful commercialization of these innovative airships. How is this structured legally? Right now, it is a limited liability company, LLC. So don't be alarmed by the 1 billion shares written at the bottom. Naturally, there cannot be a limited liability company with shares. Therefore, the legal form is as follows. The founding of this company will comprise Solar Group and its subsidiaries with a share of 49%. This is indeed the very financial company that is indeed engaged in attracting investments. And this company, Solar Group in turn, will sell investment shares that you can purchase to become a part of their innovative and sustainable energy projects, providing you with an opportunity to contribute to a greener future. It turns out that you are actually purchasing shares of the Solar Group company, and indeed the Solar Group in turn owns a 49% stake in this LLC. In fact, this is a significant investment. After the funding is successfully completed, the Nova company that we are indeed creating will already transform into a joint stock company, POM, and will therefore issue shares to the public. And accordingly, approximately 49% of all the shares will remain with the Solar Group. After that, the Solar Group will then exchange the shares purchased by investors for stocks. And accordingly, each of you will receive shares of this company, becoming a full co-owner and shareholder. I think it's clear to you what can be done with stocks and how one can earn from them. There are traditionally two options. The first option, you can hold on to these shares. The stock of any successful company always tends to grow and it doesn't necessarily have to be a billion dollar capitalization for everything to be sold. You can hold uh, shares of this company for 5-10 years, pass them on as inheritance. They are your private property. So you can take a long-term approach here. If you hold these shares, then of course you can naturally expect a portion of the income. And therefore, as a result, proportional to your share in the company in the form of dividends. And that is why Fyodor has already mentioned that the company plans to pay dividends. Yes, a portion of the profits that the company will earn will be distributed among the shareholders. And accordingly, you as a shareholder will also be able to receive this money. After this share issuance, the company plans to issue approximately 1 billion shares and 49% of that billion will be distributed among all of the investors. The company Solar Group will issue approximately 50 billion shares in total which will be sold to investors essentially for approximately $100 million and each individual investor will be able to understand clearly how many shares they have, what exact percentage they own of the total number of shares and it is not at all difficult to calculate how many stocks will also belong to them and then accurately calculate all personal benefits. It is abundantly clear that the project will be financed for some time. It won't happen in one day or in a month. As we have already mentioned, we are setting a time frame of approximately three to five years until the final funding is secured. And for your convenience, this funding is separated into distinct 20 funding stages. How do these stages differ? At each stage, there will be different investment conditions, such as 
I think it's clear to you that if you invest, for example, in the first or second stage of financing, you are taking on much greater risks than those people who will come a couple of years later and invest in the 17th or 18th stage because there are still many questions. The website is not up yet. Full work hasn't started. We are currently at the very beginning. But if you invest today, your risk will indeed be offset by the fact that you are currently receiving the best investment conditions significantly. Therefore, the initial stage of financing is always the most advantageous in terms of the cost of one share at which you acquire it, but it is also more risky. At the same time, please note that we are currently in the zero stage, and you can see this on the slide. We also call it the pre-launch stage, the preparatory stage. That is, our full financing has not even started yet. It will begin as soon as we move on to the first of the 20 investment stages. But even now, we have currently started attracting the first initial investments to organize and launch the important project. For example, Fyodor said the office has already been chosen and work will begin there soon. At the current pre-launch stage, you have the opportunity to enter under the best investment conditions that will never be available to anyone else in this project. And it is important to note that they are significantly more profitable in the long run. Moreover, they are twice as profitable as they will be in the first stage of financing as well. With each stage, the investment conditions will become slightly less and less attractive. But naturally, they will be offset by the fact that the risks of the project will decrease month by month. So, friends, if you are among those who like this topic, if you are among those who are ready to support our project from the very beginning, then, of course, I definitely recommend that you do not miss the financial opportunities that are available to you today. To explore more detailed investment conditions and additional information, please visit our personal account. There you can see exactly what we offer and more details. We do not sell our shares individually. We sell them in bulk and combine them into so-called packages for your utmost convenience and benefit. That is, you can pay, for example, $1,000, and for $1,000, you will have a certain number of shares, for instance, 100,000 shares. And if you take a larger package, considering the benefits, the wholesale price improves significantly, and the greater your overall investment strategy the more advantageous it becomes for you financially on a per share basis. Also, please note that you can invest gradually and steadily. You can secure the share package that you choose and not pay the full $1,000 at once, but instead stretch this payment over 10 or even 20 months, contributing just $50 or $100 at a time, making it easier for you. The investment conditions will be secured for you. At the moment, you start currently paying for this investment package. This is also done for you because we promote a policy that you should invest a small amount. This is generally a standard investment paradigm where you should invest 5 to 10, 15% of your income. And this proportion will allow you to do it monthly because in investments, the one who wins is not the sprinter. It is the one who runs the marathon. Please also note that we have customer support available in our personal account, which you can access at any time. You can always log in and read all the information there in the account, including detailed guides and FAQs. If you have any questions, write in the online chat, where you will always receive guidance and help to sort everything out. For those who have been with us for a long time and who helped develop this project, I want to remind all of you that in this new investment project okay, we are discussing today, we have preserved all partnership structures. We promised that we would do this and of course we kept our word. Systems. Now you can promote both the Sobelmash project and the Dirigible project and also receive referral rewards without any restrictions. In addition, you can promote other projects such as these. The only limitation is related 
to those clients of yours who registered in the personal account before August 7th specifically, if you have such clients, in order to receive referral rewards from them, you need to follow a simple yet very detailed and comprehensive marketing plan that is currently being displayed on your screen. Here are a few straightforward and easy to follow steps that you can take to ensure that you continue to earn income from your previous clients even after the initial project has been completed. Detailed information is also available on our landing page, which is located in the personal account. Please read it. There is all the detailed information and it will be updated and expanded. We are absolutely starting this project from completely different starting positions. And when we started financing the investment project Sobelmash, we had an audience of only 6,000 people in the V Contactor group. Right now, we currently have more than 500,000 individuals registered right now on our online investment platform. And we can already see that the funding for this project will definitely move significantly faster. I looked at the statistics. In the first month of our first project, Sobelmash, we had 135 investors, while in the new project, we had almost one and a half thousand investors in the first month. This means that our current pace is 10 times higher than the pace we had in the first investment project. So don't be fooled by the fact that there are many stages. They won't all come together easily. And this pre-launch phase that we are currently in, which is this particular phase, is expected to be quite short. We initially stated that we plan to raise approximately $2.5 million as part of this pre-launch phase. Currently, this figure has been preliminarily reduced to $1 million. So it turns out that by around the middle, we have already attracted approximately about 50% of that million so if you certainly plan to invest, remember that your time here is limited. I would also like to draw your attention to the extremely important fact that the investment packages you purchase today can only be increased as long as the pre-launch phase currently lasts. As soon as we move to the first stage of financing, it will no longer be possible to increase your current investment packages. Only new ones will indeed be available under the conditions that will be accessible at that time. So think again about whether you have made the level of financial investment that is acceptable for you. Please note that we currently have long payment plans. Please carefully and thoroughly consider this. Some packages have payment plans of 50 months. You see, the investment package is really large, for example, for $50,000. But if you look over a period of time of 50 months, a relatively small and consistent monthly investment will allow you to obtain better investment conditions and secure a large and substantial investment package over such a long distance. So dear friends, if you are very much interested in truly becoming co-owners of the business we told you about today, indeed, if you want to see airships in the sky again, in the stratosphere, and if you definitely care about who will absolutely make it happen, because we will definitely start seeing them once more in the near future. Fyodor mentioned today that many countries and many companies are actively moving in this direction. But if you want these to be our Russian airships, be sure to support our project and watch as we literally create a global airship construction company right before your eyes. We are dedicated to innovation and excellence in airship technology, and your support will help us achieve our ambitious goals. Join us on this exciting journey and witness the future of air travel unfold. So let's bring back airships together, everyone. And with that, I think we can move on to your questions. In the contact section on YouTube, Make sure to write down exactly what you want to convey. Do it right now, and let's take a moment to quickly go through each point in detail to ensure everything is clear and accurate. So, Fyodor, you can hear me right now at this very moment. I will read out a few questions for you, some questions that are potentially related to investments, and maybe I will answer them myself. Well, 
here is the very first question that we have prepared for you today. We talked about the fact that there are other companies today that are building airships. And the question is whether we can be competitive and whether we can be better than the Chinese or the Germans in this field. A bit of a motivating speech to actually charge up the energy. In general, we have no competitors. All those people who promote airship construction are our colleagues. To establish the industry, we need to help each other, not compete. The field is truly untapped, starting from small drones that can carry 500 kilograms over 500 kilometers, or a couple of tons over a few thousand kilometers, and ending with huge specialized platforms that perform specific tasks for specific countries. For us, for example, this is Cosmos, the delivery of our launch vehicles. They have their own nuances in our latitudes, especially in the north. They have their own specific tasks. Everyone has their own unique tasks. And everyone has their own tasks. There will most likely not be some kind of universal, so to speak, single solution, definitely. So that they think someone has done it and everyone is like, well, that's it, the market is occupied for us. No. If someone is indeed doing something, we truly need to unite with them, we need to be friends, and only together can we truly conceive and create this industry. What is being done here by one person? There by one person, and here by one person is not competition. They are our colleagues, and it is truly better for everyone to help each other. It's clear that this is obviously a matter of profit, and since this is clearly a commercial enterprise, you need to make the best airships, and it is you who should be selling them. That's all obvious indeed. There will be clients for everyone and they will have their own clients as well. For example, the Chinese will need this, as will the French and the English, and we will have our own clients. This is because the industry is still in the formation stage. It is clear that at the end of this race, well, at least in the middle, about a third of the way through this race, somewhere around 15 years from now, God willing 20, only the leaders will remain. We naturally plan to be among the leaders, and ideally we absolutely want to be the very first. Even if you are second or conditionally third, the industry leaders will remain, and they will still share the market among themselves. Some will perform specific functions, while others will have their own functions. Some will be operating companies, some will be manufacturing, and some will be design firms. Some will have better shells, while others will have better engines. Everything will settle down. This is usually how the market operates. The fact is that there are only three companies left that are capable of producing long-haul aircraft. But when it comes to cars, for example, there are so many brands that you can't even count them on your fingers. You simply don't know them all, as new ones seem to be born almost every day. And all commercially successful, wealthy... That is, I wouldn't think about competition at all. For the next 20 years, everything we do will be in demand. And further, yes, you absolutely need to be a leader so that you are not eaten alive. And we plan to be such. Yes, friends, I also thought about it and want to ask you a question while Fyodor was answering. I have noticed more and more viewers during our webinars as we conduct them. Just right, it's even interesting. Maybe someone just comes in with specific questions so that we understand, or maybe seven o'clock suits us better than five. This helps us understand why the number of viewers increases over the course of the webinar, although usually it is the other way around. Sometimes people get tired and leave. So taking this opportunity, please don't forget to like where you are watching on YouTube or vContact. Just go ahead and click. Don't be lazy. Remember that the project is a community initiative. And it depends on each of you how quickly what we have discussed will happen. It will happen in any case. But in two years, in three, in four, yes, it depends on you. I think you are all interested in making this happen as soon as possible, so that you can also be proud that it all came about thanks to you. And sharing this is also very important. The next question is about shooting a gun at the airship. The gas will escape, yes. The airship will fall. How will it be protected? Well, if you shoot a gun at a car, 
the car won't come out unscathed either. If you hit the engine, it will stall immediately. Both an airplane and a helicopter, if they are not armored military vehicles, will all suffer from a gunshot, and something will naturally happen with the structure. If it is a large enough device and the screw has managed to penetrate it completely, it would have only pierced one section, and it is quite likely, of course, that the sensors will register a drop in pressure. But overall, it was a non-critical load. The passengers wouldn't even notice it. It would calmly reach its destination, and if it's clear that it's not a week-long flight but rather a day, then it would still pass through without issues. We had an experience here in Russia when we tested these airships of the AU series. A propeller broke. The propeller was in a ring. It shattered the ring, and a piece of the ring punctured the envelope. It wasn't a complete breach in that direction, but there was a hole and gas was escaping. Everyone was upset that the propeller had broken and the ring was gone. We attached a spare propeller and flew to where we needed to go. We parked the airship in the hangar and only the next morning did we go in and see that something was wrong. The fact that it is deflated. We found a puncture. The gas there is not under as much pressure as in the wheel. It doesn't explode, it doesn't pop. The pressure is about atmospheric, and the flow of gases from here is not fast. It turns out even based on experience. Considering that the state will be multi-sectioned and so on, even the removal of one or two sections will not affect its flight technical characteristics in any way. By the way, tell me a little more about it, because I think it's really important to be honest, when I first learned about this, I was really pleased and surprised that it works exactly like that. This balloon, yes, it's not just filled with gas. It is actually indeed completely filled in sections. And if, as someone wrote, you shoot from a gun, well, one section deflates, right? But the others remain, and you can land safely, for example. Yes, but even the word deflated. It's not like a balloon. There will be a puncture, and for some time gas will be escaping, yes. And for some time, maybe even the first hour, you won't even visually understand whether it is deflating or not. If it is a rigid device, then you will never understand it at all. There are soft, semi-rigid and rigid types. In a rigid device, you won't see that it is deflating at all because the frame maintains its shape and you can remove one section entirely and nothing will change. What more can I say about it? It's just multi-sectioned. Ideally, of course, we want to come to such a device. It may not be perfect, and it's somewhat of a fantastic story. But think about the regular pomegranate that you buy in the store. You break it open and there are many small berries lying next to each other. This is a fantasy, obviously. The fact that there will be small gas bags makes everything heavier, because as you can see, the shells are double but one could get creative and make it so that the membranes are single between these bags. In response to the question how to supply gas there, there must be capillaries between the membranes. But the ideal picture of the world is when inside this airship there are many compartments. And even if a bullet passes through it like this, it only disables a very narrow part. Everything else remains untouched. This is the ideal scenario. Of course, there won't be such small ones. They will be a bit larger. But overall, it will be something like that. Well, I think the question is about technology, right? Mm, so, as an idea, it's interesting. Now, the next question is about helium. Where will we get it in such quantities? Well, there is a lot of helium on the planet, and I just read that the guys were asking, what are we going to fly on? Hydrogen is explosive. Helium will start to run out in about 150 years and will be very expensive. Well, we have helium for the first 150 years. There is a lot of helium. Its production is increasing and will continue to increase, and it is also becoming cheaper now. At the same time, a lot of helium will be produced in our country in the near future. And they also have a question about the delivery of liquefied helium, for example, to countries in Asia. If we solve this problem, not only do we earn from it, but we also gain access to a source of free helium. 
Well, in terms of barter, it's clear that no one will do anything for free there, but in general, in our country, there are so many resources that there will definitely be enough for our airships. And for our neighbors too, for example, the Chinese will have enough. Everyone is talking about the competitors, about the Chinese, and who will sell them helium for the airships, or will they be flying on explosive hydrogen? Well, there's something to negotiate. So friends, I would like to remind you to pay attention to the description of the broadcast on YouTube or Vcontacte, wherever you are watching. We have a list of relevant social networks and I recommend that you subscribe to them. There is Telegram, Vcontacte, and specifically in Telegram, we have a group and a chat and including the section with questions. So if, for example, you are watching the recording or if you want to ask Fyodor some other question, you can do that there. Well, there you can follow what we are doing in a format that is convenient for you. So be sure to subscribe. Moreover, we remember that traditional content is the most watched on YouTube, but YouTube may still be blocked again, if not today, then tomorrow. Therefore, to avoid getting lost, make sure to definitely subscribe to the other places. And regarding the team, we constantly talk about how we have gathered various designers and they will be working together in Moscow. Does that mean they all live in Moscow? Or how will we collaborate with people from other cities? Yes, the main team is all currently located in Moscow, primarily working at Moscow Space and various other different enterprises. So to answer briefly, yes, indeed, everyone is in Moscow. And soon everyone will start working, right? In that office you mentioned. Yes, definitely. And already this month. They are asking about discounts on tickets for airships for the 101,000 club investors. Alexei is asking, by the way, Alexei, we were discussing this very seriously. I personally like this idea, so I fully accept it. You can talk to Sergei Shevchenko if you are from the 101,000 club, so that he, as they say, doesn't forget to convey this idea to us. I think it's possible. And since the question is about clubs, I remind you, friends, that our clubs of a thousand and a hundred are expanding. Previously, these were clubs for those who invested in the Sobelmash project. Now they are clubs for the entire Solar Group company. And you can once again join the club of first investors by investing in the new investment project, the Next Generation Airship. Club members have a number of exclusive privileges over other investors. So if you want to be in the club, make sure to review the important terms. We have all the additional information and details in the news. Access to the club is available with certain investments. For Club 1000, it's from $5,000. And for Club 100, I believe it's from twenty dollars or $25,000 in the new project. And the number of spots is limited. The club of 1,000 has 1,000 people and the club of 100 has 100 people. In the first project, I believe that within a year or even less, all the clubs were definitely filled quite quickly, so please take note of this. I wanted to say, regarding the clubs, the tickets and so on, such as and other related events, I distinctly remember that it was clearly mentioned in one of the very first webinars that there will definitely be free rides either for the various clubs or for the potential investors. I think that this has actually already been recorded somewhere and they will show it to us later. So it's not just discounts, we've already signed up for free rides as well. So welcome to the clubs. Yes. Considering that, as I mentioned, there are 12 flights a day in Germany, yes, this is done by a tourist airship, but while we take all the investors on rides with about 10, 12 flights around Moscow or Sochi, I think we will manage it in a couple of years. Well, what an experience in operation. Well, yes. 
Plus, we also definitely promised that we would hold a conference on the first tourist airships. Who to invite to the conference, not just people from the club, naturally. Artyom is also writing, and I have already seen his question somewhere, I think, or a suggestion, to actually set up the solar group office on an airship and hold seminars and conferences there, so we will soon be conducting webinars from the airship as well. A person writes that they are indeed ready to retrain from a helicopter pilot to a lighter-than-air airship pilot. Where should they submit their documents for retraining? Well, we just need to wait another six months to a year, and then there will be a place where you can submit your documents. We will publicize all of this on all websites, in all social media, and so on. Methodologies are still needed for retraining. We need to organize the entire process, we need to create a simulator and so on. In general, just wait a little bit and the enrollment will be open. I don't know how we will conduct this, whether it will be based on some kind of competition or something else. But in general, we will need the first pilots. Most likely, all of this will be funded through training. But due to the project, it will naturally be necessary to recruit, train and create the required teams. And what if you really get in? This team will be absolutely incredible, simply amazing. Just wait a little longer. In a year, the very first airship will indeed already take off. It will likely take off in both unmanned and manned versions. So far, there are currently pilots who already have a sort of license for airships in place. But from the moment it takes off, we will already need to prepare a large crew in a year. Well, in general, yes, those people who often write that they want to work in the company or something else. I will repeat once again that you need to reach out to Fyodor, so to speak. As for how to best contact him, you can either join our group on Telegram, find him there, and message him directly, or you can write to support in your personal account. There is an online chat or a phone number you can call, and they will provide you with the contacts if you want to make a proposal or apply for a job. All of this is quite possible. All of an earth. But when the website of the technological company itself appears, I think it will be safe to call. So, will the number of shares in the packages change when transitioning to the first stage? Yes, it will change. This is precisely the essence of financing. This is what we talked about today. You see a package of shares and it costs, for example, $1,000. And right now, in this package of shares, there are, for example, 100,000 shares. For $1,000 buying 100,000 shares, 100,000 shares. What will happen when we transition to the first stage of financing? In this package, there will be essentially half as many shares, meaning our discount will be basically reduced by half. The change will be very, very radical. So by paying, the same $1,000, you will receive not 100,000 shares, but 50,000 shares. This is precisely the pre-launch stage today, a stage characterized by the highest level of uncertainty and risk. But this is more than compensated by the current investment conditions. Well, there is a suggestion that various proposals need to be made for a coating that will block leaks, yes, in the case of a gunshot, and there are other proposals here as well. Well, I understand, Fedor, that you are also reviewing things, and there are some interesting ones that can be taken into account. I've started to hear you quieter, Pasha. Either you've put your hand on the microphone or something. It seems not. I hope I can fix the sound now. It seems... Regarding self-healing coatings, there are such technologies. They were developed for spacecraft, including for the ISS, International Space Station, when micrometeoroids penetrate them. For example, the outer layer of the station so that it can heal itself there. All of this is available. Will this be applied to aeronautics? 
I think that time will definitely come eventually, and yes indeed, self-healing coatings will appear if they are needed at all. In fact, the idea that the coating could somehow get punctured or that someone might shoot at it is just, well, a force majeure. It is not necessary to implement this in every device universally. There may be some unstable regions or specific tasks that the devices will perform where it will be critically important and necessary. In this case, yes. But in a situation where your device is flying along calm routes and nothing particularly critical is anticipated, well, there is obviously no point in that. Why overload it and make it more expensive? But if again a client appears who says, I don't care, the most important thing is that it is self-healing, please. The technologies are available. The question is one of feasibility. Well, yes, it surprises me a bit too. For some reason, everyone wants to pierce the airship, shoot at it, or do something else. Although, in my opinion, the answer is obvious. Indeed, for some reason, such questions are not asked about helicopters. What will happen to a helicopter if it is shot at? Probably it will fall. Like anything else, it can be broken. A dirigible is no exception, of course. Next. Friends. I read all the questions from the channel Next Generation Airships, our official channel. By the way, be sure to subscribe to it. We have 619 subscribers. They will check if they have subscribed. Many watch unsubscribed and some are from other social networks. And also please kindly subscribe to the other social networks mentioned in the description. There is kindly one last question here. If a person paid $5,000 out of the $10,000 in the packages, will he enter the club 1,000? Yes, Vitali, he will. The most important thing here is that you must actually invest $5,000 or more. In that case, you will enter the club of 1,000. But, as I mentioned, the number of spots in these clubs is limited. In our first project, there are also 1,000 people, and some think we are being clever that there are 2,000 or 3,000. No, there are really 1,000 people in this club, and there will also be exactly 1,000 here. So you need to invest not just $5,000, but do it faster than the others, because naturally, not everyone who wants to join the club will make it in time. Some will be quicker to bring in that $5,000. So let's move on. And uh, what happened in the Sovelmash project when someone, as you know, indeed remember indeed from Africa invested a lot of money several hundred thousand did you also not let him into the significant thousand club well I don't remember us letting anyone into the club of course I admit that something could have happened and someone might not have told me something just asked as if you know but yes not really many people asked when these clubs ended some were so surprised because everyone thought it was some kind of marketing that we would all join the club but no, these conditions, privileges, so to speak, for the strawberries, are provided to a limited number of people. It's clear. That African guy who charged several hundred thousand dollars really had bad luck, and they didn't even let him into the club. But with such clients, of course, if a person invests several tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, we still consider them VIP clients. Of course, we will still pay special attention to them when addressing certain issues, if necessary. But not everyone will be part of the club. A club is a club. That makes it more interesting. So, I'm moving on, friends, to Vcontacte. Let's see what we have here. The first question is about the referral link. Will the referral link in the new project be the same as in the Sovelmash project? Yes, your referral link is exactly the same. At the moment, it is unified for you because you register a person in your structure within the personal account and already within the personal account of our investment platform. Your client can choose either the first project, the second project, or both projects simultaneously, meaning you will receive referral rewards. So, questions? If I invest $2,000 now, what percentage of the income will I receive? Alexander, I can't tell you right now. 
I don't have that calculation at the moment, but you can easily calculate it yourself. You know what the total amount being raised is. You know how many shares and how many stocks will be issued and what the profit will be. In general, here it's for themselves. I can't say that I have problems. I can't say that I have problems. 10. Of course, we need to be reasonable people and we cannot promise or guarantee any profits here. Yes, we cannot say that. For every invested ruble, you can earn about 10 rubles and 15 kopecks because in any business, you can't calculate everything down to the last kopeck, so to speak. There is a business plan, a business model, benchmarks and earnings, but everything can always change. Only some financial pyramid can guarantee that, which pays you a stable percentage. They say 10% per month and they do pay it, but only for a short time. Yes, in business, everything is different. In business, you can never promise something down to the last penny, but if everything works out, you have the opportunity to earn both honestly and to develop significant technology and accordingly to earn in the long term. I performed calculations from both sides on my calculator and I got a figure that may be incorrect. However, you will receive exactly one thousandth of approximately 50% of our total profit. That is, if we take into account the fact that 50% of the company belongs to the investors. The question, of course, is how much profit will be sent there. Conditionally, 50% of all profits will go to dividends. We will formulate this policy now. In the future, it may be more. So that's 0.01% for $2,000 from 50%. If I calculated everything correctly, Well, I am usually asked during webinars, how much is this? How much is that? And I just want to make sure I don't miscalculate. It's quite simple. We take 50%, divide it by $100 million, which gives us the total amount, and then multiply by 2,000. And from that million, we get 1,000. Yes, yes, something like that, it seems. So here's a question about the error transfer. I don't know. Fyodor, do you know what that is? The government funded it, and for some reason it closed down. If I remember correctly, Erosmena is about flying saucers, which are also known as UFOs. Erosmena is a fascinating topic. Hey Google, okay Google, Russian next generation airships, please. Yes, it's about discopters. In general, it's a dead end story. Airship pilots have several uh, flaws, one of which is uh, gigantism. They are designing a small airship, and then by slightly increasing the linear dimensions, the volume and lift forces increase significantly. So they want to make it larger, eventually reaching the point where they propose a huge project to the investor or the government. At the same time, without even having a small device, everyone is saying like, how are you going to build something huge right away when you have like absolutely nothing? Well, the airship enthusiasts are starting to prove their point and effectiveness. In general, there is no truth on either side and nothing is getting off the ground. The second sin of airship designers is that they all try to change the shape as if the cigar shaped form is unattractive. It is long and it is clear that if you make it into a disc, its geometric appearance will be more understandable and visually pleasing. The lift remains the same conditionally, but the geometric dimensions are more pleasant to the eye, and everyone thinks that these will have huge cigar shapes looking at this advanced form. However, the problem with this advanced shape is that it requires a lot of energy for stabilization. In other words, to stabilize a cigar-shaped vehicle in space, certain efforts are needed. To stabilize the disc, these efforts need to be multiplied by 10, for example. The disc tries, if it is filled with helium and everything is simply turned off, to do this, that is, to float, to become like a coin, to lie on its side, 
and so on. It is clear that if it is overloaded, it will not tip over to the side at all. But in the aero transfer project, they place everything right inside the disc, so it starts to have this desire to make such movements. And these movements need to be stabilized with screws, meaning that in order to hover, it needs to expend energy. This energy needs to be sourced from somewhere. It's clear that solar panels are involved here as well. However, since the energy required is much greater than that needed for stabilizing the cigar, it becomes a less advantageous form. Here they recently made a very small model. Was it indeed called Anuta? They already had a small disc-shaped device there, supposedly even with propellers, and they planned for it to hover in the air and ideally fly somehow. However, they couldn't stabilize it even while holding it by ropes because it was swaying so much. It was trying to rise in one direction and then in another. The propellers couldn't handle it. Overall, the aeronautics team is doing a great job pushing the direction of airships forward. If they ever succeed in creating a disc plane, they could even erect monuments to it. If it proves to be economically viable, they could even make the monument out of gold. But for now, there are no noticeable prospects in the near future. The fact that they promoted it, yes, uh, indeed, thanks to the founder or the ideologist Sergei Benzin. He speaks well, appears on various television shows, he is invited, and he occasionally says silly things with a very serious expression. But he is advancing the topic itself, for which we are very grateful. Here we go. Immediately, several questions regarding the club. We started talking about it, and the strawberries have woken up and are watching our broadcasts. There are questions about whether there will be a club in every project and what those questions are. Will there be a club in each project? We have a single club, which is the Solar Group Club. In the club, we have approximately a thousand investors who have invested in the Suvomash project. And now there will be another thousand people who will invest in the new project. So far, each project involves a thousand people. I am answering the next question. The next project will also have a thousand. But yes, such a trend is currently emerging, and it is quite possible that we will proceed this way. To join the club of a thousand investors in Solar Group, one must be among the first thousand investors who invest a certain amount in order to be successfully included in the next new project that will be launched. You now have the opportunity to invest in a next generation state project to receive all the terms and privileges of the club members. And there are quite a few of them. They are attractive, so take a look at them. In particular, there are privileged investment conditions, especially for the Club 100. And of course, there are even more benefits, including a personal manager, for example, so pay attention to that. So here is the question that Evgeny is asking. And by the way, it's not the first time it's been asked and I answered it incorrectly during one of the recent webinars. What is the question? If you are already in the 1000 Club and today you invest in a new project, do the favorable investment conditions perhaps remain for you? I said no, but actually, yes, we did agree on these terms. I even forgot myself. So if you are already in the 1000 Club, for example, or in the 100 Club, you have privileged investment conditions. Specifically, there are minus three stages, for example, in which you can invest. This works for both the Savolmash project and the new generation airship project. So here is the last question that I see on Vicontacte. What is the maximum weight that a cargo airship can lift? Solkovsky designed airships in general. They were several kilometers long. However, he did not mention their weight in tons. He wrote about thousands of people. That is, he measured in thousands of passengers. I don't remember how many there were, but it was a lot. In general, up to 500 tons. It is already possible to build easily now. You can build a thousand or even two thousand. The question will then be, why make them? For example, if you put 500 ton vehicles into series, you can dock two or three of these. 500 ton vehicles together like a train, and there you have one and a half thousand tons being carried. And theoretically, well, 2,000 tons, sure, we can perhaps build devices, maybe even more. 
why it's unclear. I think everything should stabilize around 500 tons, give or take. There will be some universal platforms in the future, for example, when several 500-ton vessels, say three 500-ton vessels, are transporting some cargo. Although it's interesting challenge to haul one and a half thousand tons with three vehicles, it might be on some rigid coupling. In general, I think we can confidently talk about 500 tons for now, but beyond that, it's not worth it. Well, and immediately the question, how do you derive from this? Well, I'm already watching on YouTube. So what size will we settle on? Not at all. We will do everything. We won't saturate the market yet, but what size are we at? I think we'll definitely get close to 500 tons. As for whether we'll go further for now, I am generally contemplating how far we will go, because 100, 200 tons is okay. It's basically, roughly speaking, doing the same thing our ancestors did. We simply must move forward because we already have different technologies and different times. Do better, run further. As for how far we will go, we will see in the future, eventually, in the end. So, I am currently looking at the questions on the Solar Group YouTube channel right now, at this moment. Is there currently no regulation regarding the use of nuclear coolants, thermal airships, or nuclear energy in airspace, currently? It is indeed very fortunate that Rosatom is a Russian company. It is a renowned leading company in the application of various nuclear technologies for non-military purposes. It's incredibly cool that it is developing and growing. In all directions, a technological company, a thriving corporation, a lot of brains, a lot of hands, a lot of talents. And I am absolutely certain that as soon as it comes to a collaborative and joint project, they will very quickly and efficiently obtain all the necessary permits and approvals to build and construct a state-of-the-art nuclear airship. Nuclear airships are interesting. Great you thought about this too. The next question is also from the same person. He asks such interesting questions. What are the prospects for using engines without moving parts, such as ion engines, in the design of a dirigible, taking advantage of the large surface area of the envelope? In the very near future, we will be launching advanced scientific equipment on long duration devices during the first stratospheric launches. We will be launching prototypes of ion engines, testing them, observing at different altitudes, different configurations, and energy consumption. At the end of all this fantastic and intricate maneuvering, we came to the realization that the body of the stratospheric airship itself, with its unique design and structure, could actually function as the engine. This discovery was both surprising and revolutionary, changing our entire approach to the project. It is clear that it can be looped and thrust can be generated easily and effectively over the entire area, obviously. The airship itself is also the engine. We just need to conduct a series of experiments and all these experiments will start this year. The stratosphere will be rising and we will share all of this, though we may not show everything or tell everything. Still, colleagues need to be supported, but they should also come up with some ideas on their own. I think we will always have to be caught between two fires. Indeed. On one hand, the project is public. We need to show everything we have, to tell stories so that there is, as they say, a spectacle, to make it interesting. This is also part of such collective financing. At the same time, there are a lot of secrets that cannot be disclosed. Sometimes you want to, but either it's too early or it's simply not profitable from a business perspective to talk about something. The question is, why are we planning only for exactly 5-10 years and not for 15? The project is very large scale. The person believes that it is necessary to plan for a longer time, as if we need at least a year. 
active development in the field of so that we can effectively plan for the same and ensure that we are prepared for the next 10-15 years. In general, the planning will be, as I said, well, most likely for about 100 years. When we significantly advance the industry, when we create, there will be no turning back and no one is planning to do so. So we are not just looking 15 years ahead, as I mentioned. We will make plans, but this requires time. Not everything can happen at once. It is impossible to predict what will happen in half an hour, let alone to say where the industry is headed. Years ago, what happened with smartphones? Well, now, okay, it's been 15 years. Well, in general, everyone understands that technologies are advancing and there could be some critical new discovery or something else that will completely change the way the industry moves forward. For example, leading to more active development. So everything is progressing steadily. Well, you say 15 years, but in reality, the first smartphone that caused such a revolution and made the phone mainstream was about 15 years ago. Yes, a little longer. That's why everything is changing so quickly. In 15 years, we will be living in a completely different world. By the way, I was just watching an interview with the same Brin we talked about today. He visited Moscow. It was 2008, 16 years ago. And in 2008, he said that he hoped mobile internet would soon be fast and efficient, allowing us to fully utilize the internet. And this was said by the co-founder of the largest technology company. And even he, so to speak, used the words, I am confident and I hope. He did not know that in 5-10 years it would be so natural. Therefore, yes, indeed, in fact, the world is changing very quickly. So, the last question is, when exactly will the money that Duin collected be returned back to the people? Well, here we actually answer any provocative questions indeed as well. You can see for yourself how indeed the project is developing at present time. We believe that this is a very successful case for us, where we have demonstrated that we can quickly gather a large audience around certain technologies and developments. And accordingly, this all translates into some financial support for our project which we are working on. And as a fact, we have raised almost $100 million completely from scratch in a relatively short period of time. And of course, everything is relative. But if you look at the world with the volumes of investments we are working with from private investors, you will hardly find an equivalent anywhere else in the world. Yes, this indeed also says a lot. And literally in approximately a month or two, the commissioning of the PKTB is already planned along with its introduction into operation. Well, 2025 should be the first commercial year for the Sobel Mesh company. Therefore, this is a positive example, extremely successful for us. And if we were able to do this from scratch in our time, we have no doubt that we will do it again, having such extremely extensive and valuable experience, developments, and representation in almost 30 different countries around the entire world where people, by the way, just like us, gather together for webinars and answer each other's questions and queries. And we can already see from the start of the financing that the audience has received this project very warmly. Therefore, this says a lot. It means that people are not disappointed with what we have done before. In this market, in the investment market, reputation is absolutely everything and we definitely already have it here again philip is once again writing who asked these interesting questions in smartphones the main characteristic of development has not been computational power but rather batteries and what could potentially serve as a similar trigger for airships in the context of modern technology Composite materials, energy efficient technologies, the same batteries, more compact lightweight engines. But again, it all comes down to the materials. 
computer technology. When the Hindenburg was being steered, everything was mechanically transmitted to the rear controls. Now you press a button and a signal runs through a single wire and in the end, the actuator does something. A whole complex of technologies has accumulated, allowing us to create airships of the same size with better quality and more advanced features. If we were to build it like the Hindenburg, it would be almost twice as efficient, faster, able to lift more, fly further and be safer. The Hindenburg famously caught fire. Everyone has seen that video. It's clear that it made numerous flights and was operated safely for several years. But once it caught fire, it went up like a house of cards, like a stack of hay. Nowadays there are materials that, even when ignited, don't burn, but they burn down. If hydrogen had exploded, the coatings would have been torn apart, but they wouldn't have burned, even though hydrogen is highly flammable. Now everything will be made from fireproof materials, and no matter how hard you try to set it on fire, it simply won't burn that way. And there are many differences. The main focus is on materials management, the development of computers, electronics, energy efficient drives, motors and technologies, and ultimately solar panels. It's probably some very specific material science indeed, and more perhaps. Well, I always think for some reason about unmanned aerial vehicles. It seems to me that this is also a part of the future. So when everyone asks about pilots, they will certainly be needed. And later, they may be required for some specific tasks. However, for basic tasks, I believe that vehicles will be unmanned in the very near future. It's clear, but the difference between a piloted airship and an unmanned one is negligible. If the airship is large, what does it matter if two pilot seats are missing? Those two seats just mean there are two more seats for passengers, which isn't really a significant difference. Unmanned vehicles in general and control systems have made a leap. They were created a hundred years ago when there were no such control systems for computing machines and so on. Now, it will be much, much, much higher quality. As for aeronautics, uh, well friends, it seems we have answered all the questions. Today we definitely agreed with Fedor that we would hold the webinar for an hour and a half, but once again we absolutely ended up at three hours. We set a record for duration. Yes, everything is the opposite for us. But on the other hand, I am very happy and grateful to all the viewers for asking so many questions and showing great engagement. This is a sign that we are not holding these webinars in vain, that our communication with you is not in vain, and that you are genuinely interested. So, well, I think we can wrap up for today. Thank you very much, dear friends. If you have any questions left, please come to the next broadcasts, write your questions to technical support, and don't forget to support us on all social media, likes, reposts, and subscribe where you watch us on vContact and beyond. Whether you are on YouTube or moving to other social networks that interest you, remember that your activity influences how our project will develop. But don't forget to send the link to this webinar to your friends so that they, not yet familiar with us, can listen to this presentation and decide for themselves whether they are ready to participate in the project or if they will wait for a couple more stages when there is already something ready. It is also possible, yes, to see when the first airship will take off. It's a pity that there won't be such investment conditions. Thank you all very much. Goodbye, everyone. And when will we see each other? On Friday, right at the next broadcast. Yes, by the way, just last Friday, we launched a competition for... People started throwing around ideas about the use of airships, including some quite unconventional ones, like cleaning up the large garbage patch in the ocean. You see, this has stuck with me. Today, we are thrilled to announce that all the ideas for our exciting competition have been submitted.
This marks a significant milestone as we move into the final stages of our contest. We are eagerly anticipating the moment when we will reveal the winner of the coolest idea. The announcement of the winner will take place in our official Telegram group, which is the central hub for all our updates and news. If you haven't joined our Telegram group yet, we highly recommend that you find it and subscribe to stay updated with the latest information. The group is called Pre-Start and it is the best place to get all the latest news, updates and engage with other participants. That's all the information we have for you at the moment. However, we have more exciting news coming up. On Friday, we invite you to join us for a special news webinar. During this webinar, our technical specialists will introduce new updates share the latest news and provide insights into our future plans. We are planning to sign in from our office and there is a good chance that we might even conduct the entire webinar from there. We are looking forward to seeing you all on Friday. Until then, goodbye for now. Don't forget to stay active in the chats everyone. Goodbye and woohoo. We are thrilled to have you with us on this journey. Your